So this is your lecture on electronegativity and polarity. So I want you to follow along. You have the PowerPoint all printed out for you, so I just want you to follow along and listen. If you feel like you should take any extra notes, just go ahead and write them down right on your PowerPoint paper. <clears throat> so first we're going to talk about definitions of electron affinity and electronegativity. They sound like they're very much the same, but they're actually quite different. Electron affinity is the measure of a tendency of an atom to accept an electron. Um, it increases with atomic number across a period and decreases down a group. That's actually the same trend that we've been talking about um, with electronegativity and ionization energy. Electronegativity, again, we've talked about this a couple times, is the ability of an atom to attract electrons. And again, it follows the same trend of, as electron affinity. We're going to talk about the corners. For both of them, you're going to find the greatest electron affinity and electronegativity in the top right corner and the least in the bottom left corner. These two things, electron affinity and electronegativity, allow us to predict what type of bond will form. What we look at is really the differences in electronegativities. There are actually values, actual numbers um, for electronegativities, but we don't really need the exact numbers. What we can do is just look at the placement of elements on the periodic table. Um, but number-wise, if the electronegativity difference between two atoms is zero, then the electrons are completely equally shared. This is called a non-polar covalent bond. And this only happens with bonds between two identical elements. So, for example, all the diatomic gases. When you have two H atoms bonded together, that is a complete nonpolar bond. When we see the word polar, you should think of poles, like north and south pole, like opposite ends, kind of like a magnet. That's what you should think of when you think of the word polar. Bonds between elements are never actually completely covalent or ionic you're going to get slight electronegativity differences and what happens is that's how you get a polar covalent bond or a polar bond for short. Sure, for sure. Large differences in electronegativities result in an ionic bond. So we look at it by the numbers. If you have an electronegativity difference greater than 1.7 it's ionic. Ionic bonds aren't polar so you're just going to have an ionic bond. If it's less than 1.70 you have a covalent bond. If it's exactly 1.0, you have a 50% ionic, 50% covalent, and as you would guess, this doesn't happen very often. And if it's exactly zero, you have a non-polar covalent bond. Again, a polar bond is a type of covalent bond, does not happen with ionic bonds, in which the electrons are not evenly distributed. There are actually more electrons down one end than the other. So that end with more negative electrons gets a slight negative charge, and the other end has a slight positive charge. Because it's not exactly a positive one charge, you're not going to use a plus and minus symbol, you're going to use this symbol. It kind of looks like a figure eight or like an eight without the little um, end to it. So if we're going to talk about a polar negative charge, you're going to use this symbol, and a polar positive charge, you're going to use this symbol. This is referred to as a dipole. Remember, di means two. So a dipole means two poles. So if we look at the picture, if you look at the gray part here, this is the electron cloud. So we have two atoms, H and Br, and you can see there are more, a higher concentration of electrons around the Br. And since electrons are negative, then this side has a slight negative charge, and this side with less electrons has a slight positive charge. This is a polar covalent bond. You have two poles, just like north pole, south pole. Again, this is water showing you the same thing. So you can actually have two slightly positive sides, but it's just the same thing as this. And remember, this is a result as an uneven distribution of electrons. You have more electrons around this atom than this atom. Molecules are either polar or nonpolar, depending on the location and nature of the bonds. Um, one way to figure out whether something's polar is to use an electric field, like magnets. If it's polar and it has a positive or negative end, it should align. So if we look at the picture, Right here, this is like two magnets, these parts right here. When they're not turned on, the, the molecules are all just jumbled. But when you turn on the magnets, see how they arrange perfectly with one side pointed to the positive, one side pointed to the negative. Notice it goes opposite. So the negative magnet attracts the positive end, and the positive magnet attracts the negative end. Solubility is the ability to dissolve. So when we say you put salt in water, it dissolves. That means salt is soluble in water. 
This is determined by the bond type. So it's all about nonpolar solvents or liquids and polar solvents or liquids. A nonpolar liquid can only dissolve a nonpolar solid. So nonpolar only dissolves nonpolar. A polar liquid can dissolve both polar and nonpolar. Water is actually a polar solvent, which is why we call it the universal solvent. It can dissolve almost anything because it's polar, and polar can dissolve both types of solids. Differences in properties are a result in the differences of attractive forces. We call these attractive forces between inter individual molecules intermolecular forces. Remember, inter is in between, and molecular stands for molecule. So an intermolecular force is a force between a molecule. It is not a bond. It is always weaker than a bond. You can kind of think of it as a bond is like super glue. An intermolecular force is like a magnet. A magnet is way easier to separate than super glue. The other term for it is van der Waals forces. Van der Waals is the person who discovered this. These two words mean the same thing. There are three types of intermolecular forces. Dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bond. If you look at it from top to bottom, this is the weakest. Next one strongest. So it goes weakest to strongest. A dispersion force is present in nonpolar substances and it is a brief attraction, a brief interaction. A dipole-dipole force is present between polar substances. And then a hydrogen bond is a dipole that is very strong. It is a molecule between hydrogen and either F, O, or N, FON, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. If you think about this, the differences. Dispersion force is between two nonpolar. Dipole and dipole are both between two polar. And the difference between dipole and hydrogen bond is a hydrogen bond is a stronger dipole. So if you look at this picture, this is showing a dispersion force. This is showing a hydrogen bond. Notice it has a hydrogen and two oxygens, F-O-N. Melting and boiling point of covalent solids are low compared to ionic. Remember, that all depends on how strongly the molecules are held together. Many exist as gases or turn into gases very quickly. They can also exist as soft solids like wax, like candle wax. Um, in a solid state, the molecules line up forming a crystal lattice, but it's less strong than the ionic crystal lattice. And that's the end of this lecture.